my background is in anthropology and in, in Melanesia and Papua New Guinea where I did my field work. Um, however, my field site, which is the Ramu Nikol project, um, I spent 12 months ethnographic field work there among the landowners, the local community, uh, and, and very much looking from the outside in towards a Chinese-run mining project there. Um, so hopefully some of my findings uh, speak to the relevance of the, of the conference. Um, and yeah, as you've mentioned, it's corporate socialist responsibility, and this is the main idea that I want to put forward in my paper. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who are the traditional owners of this land, um, pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the landowners who uh, granted, who very uh, generously hosted me during my field work for 12 months in both Kurumbakari and in Bazamuk. Um, this is a picture of the rum and nickel mine from the outside. Um, it's very dusty, it's very dry. Um, and in, I was, uh, a, as an observer, not being able to interact with the workers, but interact with the local people. Um, so this very much frames my study. And I would see stickers around the mine uh, from local people, from NGOs, with the Papua New Guinea flag. It says, land is life, protect your land. Um, anyways, my, what I'm going to do today is outline what is corporate social responsibility, uh, how it's loosely defined in this concept, and then introduce what I'm calling co corporate socialist responsibility. Um, and the evidence that I'm going to provide to back this up is from one case study, which is the Ramu Nickel Cobalt Project in Papua New Guinea, and look at a couple of different ways in which the uh, company engaged with the local community. And so through Chinese acrobats, providing tertiary scholarships to locals, uh, attempts to establish a Confucius Institute in Papua New Guinea, and then also through local print media. And so this is, this is what I'll, I'll do today. What is corporate social responsibility? Uh, it's quite a nebulous term. It's, it's been, there's lots and lots of definitions. However, uh, Hundal Tadal talk about this bundle of practices and actions that take into account the expectations of diverse stakeholder groups and a triple bottom line of economic, social, and environmental performance. And so at its core, a lot of uh, commentators have talked about this triple bottom line of economic, social, and environmental performance. This is also characterized by the three Ps, um, so people, planet, and profit. What I'm proposing is that there's an extra P, or a fourth bottom line, if you like, for Chinese uh, state-owned enterprise operating abroad, and at least with my case study. And that in addition to the economic, social, and environmental performance, uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises, with my example, the Roman MCC, uh, must also promote the geopolitical goals of the Chinese Communist Party abroad. Um, this is not, I, 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 this is not a, a sort of formal uh, written edict, but through the evidence, through the actions of one state owned enterprise in Papua New Guinea, um, I argue that this was generally the case. So, first of all, to start off, let's look at Papua New Guinea. And for the Metallurgical Corporation of China, who is the uh, majority operator of the Ramu nickel mine, it was a steep learning curve for them. You can see in the, in, the gen, in the middle of the map a little red dot, which is the Ramu mine. However, Papua New Guinea is a country with, uh, a ble who are either blessed or cursed, depending who you talk to, with natural resource wealth. And you can see that there's a lot of other mining projects all in the country that are run by Australian, Canadian, United States, uh, American companies. Uh, MCC was the first Chinese company to come into Papua New Guinea the, with construction in 2005, and then also and the, the project which co began commissioning in 2012. A couple of points to note, this preceded the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is important, and then also uh, they, they were in a country which is already very much literate in corporate social responsibility from a Western point of view, from Western companies. 
Uh, it was a, com a country which has already gone through a conflict in Bougainville over a copper mine. It had seen environmental disaster at the Octedi mine from BHP. So there, there's quite a lot written about engagement between Western corporations and local people. Um, what makes my case study a little different is that it was the first Chinese-run company to enter Papua New Guinea. And, to, and I was interested in how the locals perceived the Chinese-ness of the project to be any different. This is a map of the Ramanical Cobalt project in Medang province. Uh, I spent 12 months in Medang based between the three points in the triangle, Medang town, where the corporate office is located, the Kurumbakari mine site on the left of the screen, and then also the Bazamuk refinery. Con connecting the mine to the refinery is about 135 kilometers of pipeline uh, that goes along the coast, and then the mine tailings are dumped into the ocean. Uh, that's a story for another presentation. Um, but essentially, what I want to start off with is Independence Day in Papua New Guinea in 2015. Uh, the mining company MCC decided to invite acrobats from Chongqing to come and perform in uh, Medang in the town, in the Divine Word University uh, Auditorium, and invited a lot of locals, a lot of local landowners, a lot of local um, leaders to come and watch the show. Uh, what was interesting is that this wa was the speech that was given by the MCC's vice president, and I've got a small excerpt of that uh, to, go to go through. It, it sounded in some ways very ambassadorial. Um, his speech before the acrobatic show said that while striving to deliver the project for a win-win situation, there must always be a balance in life, whether it's independent or a family gathering. This is, part, this is a natural part of human instincts. So as a Chinese company, this is our privilege to witness the first Chinese cultural show in Medang. While we present the 2,000 years of history in this show, we are mindful of Papua New Guinea and Chinese cultural diversities that both countries enjoy and stand proud to promote while accommodating regional and global benefits in economics and business in the 21st century, where multi-plural multi diplomacy is encouraged. We can further state that while cultural diplomacy to sustain and appreciate people to people exchange in events like this acrobatic performance, which you will enjoy soon. In celebrating the 40th anniversary of PNG's independence, I believe this show will bring you excitement and the refreshing feel of Chinese culture. It was very much had an ambassadorial kind of nature to it, and it was very different to what I thought a mining executive would talk about. And what what it came across to me while I was watching this display was that the state-owned enterprise MCC, which uh, is quite a traditional SOE, it's it's been absorbed into min metals now, but they were fulfilling a lot of different roles uh, within, and not just trying to extract minerals from the ground. Uh, the, and without much support from the local, from the government, it was very much up to them to negotiate how to engage with the local community. Another example I, I tracked down um, of uh, local engagement was through tertiary scholarships to China for Papua New Guinean students. And this was something the mining company promoted within the local community to uh, try and encourage locals to study in China, then come back and work for the company. Um, I followed some of their stories in my thesis, and this is a picture from the Papua New Guineans who celebrated their Independence Day in 2016 by traveling up to the Great Wall of China and taking photos of them with the PNG flag. Um, this is another example of a mining company sort of acting outside of its modus operandi, which is extracting nickel from the ground. Thirdly, another attempt by MCC uh, while I was there was to establish a, a Confucius Institute at Medang's Divine Word University. Uh, this was an unsuccessful attempt and was blocked by the, uh, the Catholic fathers who run the university. Um, however, it was of the same rationale to try and encourage Papua New Guineans to be more literate in Chinese. Now, since my field work, there has been a Co Confucius Institute established in Lay, which at the University of Technology. 
the photo on the left is from a, a strike at the mine where the local uh, employees advocated that they needed the operational language chose, changed at the mine from Chinese to English. And that this was creating a lot of safety and a lot of uh, occupational health and safety hazards for the local employees. And this is a, a, perf a persistent issue at the Ramanikal Cobalt site, which differentiates it from other mining projects in Papua New Guinea. You have this divided, linguistically divided uh, workforce. Finally, there were, in, there were attempts by the Ramanikal uh, Corporate Affairs Office to educate locals in print media about Chinese culture. And what I have here is a picture of Chinese zodiac, but with the animal names in Tokpizen, which is the lingua franca of Papua New Guinea. And the, the caption says, the sign belong 12 plat animal, na all year inside log calendar belong all signer, which is the Chinese zodiac and the 12 signs of, of so there were attempts as well to educate. What does this all tell us? It says, in, and from the Chongqing Arts Group, from Confucius Institutes, attempts to establish a, a, a Confucius Institute and also employ tertiary education in China. What, it's, what I found was lacking is that it doesn't address the local needs for development. This was on the terms of uh, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, priorities, which were to promote Chinese culture in Papua New Guinea. And what it was really, la and so this, this is where I come back to this idea of corporate socialist responsibility, that there's an extra bottom line, maybe a fourth bottom line here about the interests of the Chinese Communist Party and that they need to be promoted, you know, above people, planet or profit. Um, so this is the general idea of my paper. Uh, I'd appreciate any of your thoughts and feedback, um, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Xue Gong um, from the Nanyang Technical University in Singapore. Um, her research interests include state businesses, in China's economic diplomacy, regionalism and governance, and geoeconomics in the Indo-Pacific. Indo it um, it's very exciting uh, to be here, and, and a big thanks to uh, Greg and, and Debbie uh, for the invitation. So speaking about the boundaries, uh, the, the conference theme, I think it is perfectly I mean, aligned with my paper because I look at the boundaries that the Chinese business um, investments have uh, in protecting, you know, their interests overseas. So eco echoing with our previous panelists, you know, like um, uh, Henrik, um, Tricia, and Debbie, I would like to explain under what conditions uh, and how Chinese state business could protect their overseas business interests. I have. Uh, been consolidating data, um, uh, which is still ongoing and in trouble projects by comparing the American Enterprise Institute as well as the media reports. Basically, I verify um, uh, the, 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 the sources and I also conduct the uh, semi-structured um, interviews. Uh, as a matter of fact, just came back from Cambodia uh, two weeks back. Um, so the whole point of my paper, uh, which is already completed as a first draft, is to uh, is to that you know the Chinese state businesses must handle their overseas investments with uh, extreme care because there are unbreakable boundaries uh, for their uh, operations overseas. Um, so um, obviously, uh, I have the research question. Um, it is how uh, China protects its overseas business interests. Analysts often treat this problem uh, as part of the the you know, the conventional approach, whether it be, you know, uh, foreign and security um, analysis or under the framework of economy statecraft. Um, those scholars include the Kirkney, you know, Miwa um, and, and Andrea, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they basically study how China has been using the foreign policy tools in the United Nations 
or in, in the format of peacekeeping in those conflict zone areas. Um, there are also emerging works um, in investigating the role of below state actors, um, like, such as you know, political agencies and elites and um, uh, brought up by uh, Alvin Kemper you know, and also Debbie, uh, in a sense how those um, you know, below state actors, they, are success they have successfully secured the business deals. But these you know, below state analysis just stop there. Um, 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 while building on those existing uh, um, research on the pluralization of economic foreign policy making in China, my paper shares insights on um, under um, you know examining the role of the Chinese business themselves, um, who actually uh, played a front line uh, in those conflicts. How they actually protect themselves. So. The, the, the question is there, but, but as I said, you know, the existing literature, they have limits. Um, they basically treated the Chinese business actors as passive actors when there are problems. They hide behind the, the, state, um, the Chinese state actors. So this is pretty much categorized as passive, um, you know, low profile, quiet, and lack of um, you know, curiosity, and lack of information in this, all these local contexts. So it overlooks the fact that the Chinese business actors, state actors, they are situated it um, in the in, in as I said in the front line of the local conflicts and they actually indeed they actually um, to have taken the initiative to protect their in interests and even act on behalf of the states in fostering the good images in the host country. So I use um, uh, one bar uh, as a case study. I demonstrate that the Chinese um, a state protects the business interests, not just by promoting the good political relations, but also uh, you know, to achieve the risk uh, reduction effects, but also by using those risk mitigation capabilities through playing their, uh, the, the business role, uh, which is forward phase role, which I'm gonna explain later. Hopefully I can make you understand. Um, but again, I also argue that the Chinese domestic political f norms, uh, in w which I label as political consciousness of their consequences, um, it is a very critical uh, variable that constrains the uh, Chinese state business charm offensive, uh, despite their growing capabilities of conducting those uh, public relations. Um, some uh, contribution that I think I need to highlight here is one is I, I look at the, um, the level of actors below the state uh, by saying that I don't really override the role of the, of the, the Chinese state. I don't deny you know, they're intertwined um, in, in terms of the rela relationship and support. Um, but I want to highlight the business actors have, can have certain level of autonomy to respond to you know, the central uh, mandate of the public relations while observing the domestic norms um, or domestic consciousness which is perceived as appropriate. And and also um, I would like to uh, explore further the endogenous variable by by adopting a normative institutional approach to understand the logic of appropriateness, which, uh, which basically strengthen the boundaries that are unbreakable in Chinese overseas um, uh, investments. All right, so some background uh, information in terms of why I uh, you know, put up this concept of uh, forward phase. Um, when I talk about the forward phase, there, there are backward phase, there are backward phases that I, uh, that I uh, actually mentioned here, right, uh, in terms of how they are being passive, being quiet, and, and being very uh, re irresponsive, right? Um, so nowadays, the Chinese um, states and cross-border investments are actually increasingly subject to the geopolitical and the reputational risks. Um, China is actually facing intensifying discourse competition on its role in the global development governance. The rising narratives around China, uh, for instance, uh, the debt trap diplomacy, um, the, uh, the, um, the imperial ambitions uh, in the Big Belt and Road Initiative have already put the hefty financial, political, and reputational strengths on China. Just look at the, uh, the, the projects in Hapatota, um, in the East Coast Railway in Malaysia, and also you look at this, uh, the, the, the project that has been scaled down by Aung San Suu Kyi government. You've seen, uh, you've, you, you can have the sense how uh, hefty these uh, strengths are on the Chinese image. And moreover, um, the Chinese cross-border investments, as Debbie just illustrated in the Myanmar case, it, it clearly it shows um, they are challenged by the rise of the populism as well as the local conflicts. Uh, the Chinese uh, projects, in a lot of cases, they are the scapegoats uh, of these local you know, contestations. So according to the research, um, which is actually in Africa context, um, it is already evidence that um, their Chinese investments are more likely to face protests 
And also I have the database, um, which is, as I said, is still ongoing, but I already identified there are more than 30 projects in Southeast Asia that are being contested, um, being protested by um, the local civil society. Um, and not to mention in Myanmar itself, you know, just as Debbie uh, illustrated about the three typical cases, but there are more uh, behind that. So. So th those um, data basically tells you, you know, the situation on the ground, um, and 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 for the Chinese businesses, um, they cannot get rid of these uh, baggages because they um, are naturally being accepted, uh, being perceived as part of this grand strategy, right? Despite how they want to get rid of that label, and and also um, they understand, you know, there are definitely unexpected outcomes of their, you know, footprints um, that can. Um, affect the cross-border relations uh, as seen in the Myanmar case. So given the above, um, the Chinese scholars and, and even the governments, they activate a much more proactive role, uh, calling for a whole government approach in terms of you know, mobilizing all the actors, uh, societal actors, think tanks, media, as well as the business actors to improve in this manner. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the Chinese um, enterprises, uh, they even host uh, you know, annual Chinese Enterprise Global Image Summit you know, things like that. So those are the, um, the domestic demands for the uh, forward phase um, or for the change in their uh, overseas business. Um, so what, are the, what do I mean, the forward phase? Um, it's, it's, some, it's, it's the concept that I'm also uh, trying to uh, work out. So basically, the forward phase is, is to, uh, to realize two things. One is to secure the investments that are being contested, and second is, if possible, they can restore, improve the image of the Chinese investments. And they must uh, you know, display the capabilities of the following, you know, for instance, in terms of setting the agenda, how the project should be going, and who is gonna be uh, included in this project, and who they should talk to, and what kind of information they should decimate, um, and how they can do to you know, uh, make the public as not just the elites, but also the public to accept uh, their uh, investments. Um, so, so as I said, you know, um, the two phases um, in my paper they are quite fluid. It's not like you know very static. I want today I wear the mask of the forward face, then that tomorrow uh, you know I'm not gonna change. So there are mechanisms in, term, in terms of how um, the Chinese uh, companies they will shift. So I brought brought up two uh, variables. Um, uh, and one is the interaction between the, uh, the Chinese um, actors and the institutional settings from both home and, and host institutions. So it's very clear cut that when the institutions from both countries, uh, the home and host countries, they send clear signals to business actors to play the forward face role, the business actors will definitely be motivated to take the cue and behave accordingly, uh, especially behave much more responsibly. Otherwise, uh, they will you know, uh, revert to the backward uh, forward face, uh, but backward face when they when they face rejections from both hosts and and home institutions. This is quite clear cut. But the uh, much more complex picture comes is when the host and home institutions differ in their policies. For instance, when the host countries uh, institutions offer explicit incentives for Chinese SOEs to play the forward face, while the home institutions do not. For example, uh, the Chinese uh, business will engage in forward face activities. So given a such a such situation, the Chinese uh, state businesses must adjust their uh, actions to respond to those local demands. Otherwise, they're going to be published um, by the local institutions. Um, but when the home institutions require businesses to play the forward face role, while the host institutions do not, the way SOEs interpret the home institutional incentives become very important. And 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 despite you know uh, the the home institutions mandate to do a much better job in building a responsibility responsible image for the Chinese state, the Chinese SOE for world face capabilities can be constrained seriously by its own interpretation of the impact of their for world face behavior. So this is where I want to brought up the concept of the logic of appropriateness uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the normative institutionalism. Um, I don't know how much you are familiar with this, but basically uh, the simple logic here is um, the Chinese state businesses, they have a dual, uh, even you know, much more complex identities. One is, is uh, they are a business entity, and second is that they are the economic statecraft tool, and third is they are, the, they are part of the party organization. So with at least three uh, identities and roles, they must ha have to, you know, they must have to navigate uh, in different situations. So, Nowadays, because of you know the 
uh, the, the much more emphasis placed on, for instance, the political allegiance to the party, and also the political and party you know, performance in their corporate um, you know, um, uh, uh, operation. So nowadays, the SOE managers, um, they uh, have different priorities. And one of the priority is perhaps they want to uh, be more mindful of their behavior in overseas business activities. And, and, and they must have the, you know, they must be equipped with the political cons consciousness in terms of what they've done, what they've spoken to, and who they've been interacting with will have uh, significant consequences. And that consequence may actually go against the political norms, which is non-interference principle you know, across the borders. I give you a very uh, good example in terms of the Myanmar uh, lepton case in, uh, you know, in the labor rights, where the, actually the Chinese managers, they want to learn the international standards, you know, uh, like have a very clear cut, very streamlined uh, labor rights, uh, the compensation, you know, the land, um, you know, appropriate, uh, the land compensation. Um, but uh, when they are dealing with the military government, uh, the managers, they're very uh, concerned about if they've done too much, if they cross the line. So, and it's, and it's also the same thing uh, when they are dealing with the Aung San Suu Kyi government, uh, because, you know, uh, despite different regulatory reforms in Myanmar on the Aung uh, there are still lots of, um, uh, you know, corruptions and, 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 and business interests, um, you know, and red tapes uh, that have been controlled by the military government. So in that sense, the, you know, the, the Chinese companies, they're much, uh, their hands are much pretty tied up uh, by this uh, political consciousness of their uh, uh, activities. So. So, so those are the uh, so the m the safest approach is to uh, go back to uh, the 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 bad world phase. So I have the the. Ep the, the different stages of um, the protest and what are they doing. The BF means backward phase, FF means forward phase. So you can see their roles have been shifting quite a lot. So this is very contextual and situation-based uh, behavior because when they feel, you know, they are motivated to uh, promote those forward phase activities, let's say the public relations, let's say talking to even the activists like the, uh, the, student, um, uh, the, the student generation and as uh, the student ADA, uh, which was ousted by the military government, uh, they've done that. And they've also talked to, uh, when the opportunity arises, they've also talked to the international uh, media media organizations such as The Economist. You cannot imagine that. And they talk to uh, the CNA, uh, BBC, et cetera, et cetera. They even invite the uh, Economist reporters to their construction sites. So those are the examples in terms of how they have been trying to align their business strategies with international practices, trying to improve on the transparency as well as improve on the uh, community uh, your relations. So there is, uh, I, let me just give me one, just one minute. So the result is they actually, you know, such behavior, um, uh, the such role, uh, make effects um, that you can see um, the Aung San Suu Kyi government supported this. But the problem is they take the Aung San Suu Kyi support as the you know, you know, as the legitimate reason why they should retreat. And because they feel, um, you know, there was not much demand from the local government. So that's how they stopped there. And the one last point I want to make is, you know, in a in a time when we have be, we've been hearing different you know uh, narratives and words about how to govern the world, how the Chinese uh, business actors they've been constrained by the domestic norms, uh, is something very critical in this great power competition. Everybody's talking about China's influences, you know, especially the West, um, in terms of how they've been using different state apparatuses. But I have I, I have really um, you know a deep suspicion on that because of the domestic uh, boundaries that uh, it, it, that cannot be. Uh, no, uh, break, broken. Thank you. We now have a discussion, a discussion period by um, uh, Mr. Ali. She also is at ANU. <laughs> hello. hello, everyone. Um, I'm actually, um, well, um, a visiting scholar here in CIW. Um, I actually made a lot of notes. Um, I just uh, told a lot of information actually bombarding and just during this short presentation. Um, but I really appreciate the, uh, the enlightening presentation by Debbie, Sean, and Xie, um, each of whom, you know, um, provide uh, um, the nuanced uh, argument on the um, diverse roles of uh, SOEs in international scenarios. 
Um, well, firstly, Debbie introduced uh, a compelling uh, perspective on the relationship between Chinese SOEs and uh, um, societal actors uh, within BIR. Um, Debbie's argument, well, she argues that the SOE's business um, behavior is contingent upon the resistance, resistance level of societal actors, if I'm correctly. Um, that is actually a kind of um, swift from existing literature um, that suggests that these enterprises mainly follow guidelines to improve social and environmental uh, compliance. So I think um, this presentation or the exploration of this dynamic actually is, uh, is enlightening. Um, however, I, I, I'm just kind of curious about the methodological choices, choices actually you made. Um, uh, since you argue that the Chinese SOEs adjust their public engagement strategies in the, in the wake of a societal um, contention a project, it will be um, beneficial to further elaborate um, on how you measure such societal contention. Um, and also, how do you avoid uh, actually the, um, uh, the, the media, you know, the bias since you use the second source? Yeah, um, that's just, just I told maybe can give uh, uh, our audience a clear understanding of your investigative process. Okay, um, move on to Sean's uh, paper. Um, this paper, I think it's offered a, a very unique actually perspective on how the MMC extends its uh, activities to pursue the CCP's geopolitical goals abroad. Um, particularly, I think that Sean's um, ethnographic work in Madame Province um, provide a, actually a fascinating lens um, through through your, you know, your um, novel concept of corporate socialist responsibility. And I think that's a um, very interesting adaptation of the traditional uh, corporate social responsibility. Um, it will be um, uh, interesting to hear actually more about, you know, the um, how this four spot line actually proposed interact with the conventional, these three aspects of CSR. Um, yeah, so I, I also actually the question, um, does prioritizing, just, just another thing just to be specific, does prioritizing the political interest of the CCP um, necessarily distract from the M MCC's commitment to the traditional element of the CSR. Um, okay, lastly, Shea's paper. Um, I think it is a, a com complex uh, exploration of the, uh, the roles of SOE in the uh, context of China's overseas uh, economic interest. Um, I found the concept of, um, actually the argument that uh, SOE can switch between uh, forward phase and the backward phase, uh, that's particularly interesting. Um, so, um, I think I would appreciate a further clarification on how SOEs manage to balance uh, the domestic constraints while still uh, contributing to the uh, protection of China's uh, overseas economic interests. 
Um, also, I actually have just one more question, sorry. Um, that's about intervening variables. Um, um, I actually was looking for the, uh, you know, the, the dependent variable and the independent variable. So um, I, I, I told maybe um, um, if this can be clarified and then uh, introduce the intervening variable will make more sense. <laughs> but I just, you know, um, thank you for your contributions and uh, I just look forward to our further discussion on these uh, captivating topics. Thank you.